Wonderful. We're going to go ahead and get started right on time here. Um, good evening, everyone. I am Catherine Younger. I am Research Director of the program Ukraine and European Dialogue at the Institute for Human Sciences. And I have the real pleasure tonight of introducing our discussion between Miroslav Maranovich and Timothy Snyder. This event is the culmination of a collaboration between our program and Miroslav to publish the English translation of his memoirs, pictured here, The Universe Behind Barbed Wire. This joint effort encapsulates one of the key tenets of this program at the Institute for Human Sciences, which began in 2015, and then includes pro projects like this book, as well as fellowships and events at the IWM. And the, one of the tenet that this encapsulates is that we all have as much to learn from the Ukrainian experience, in this case, from the human rights movement in Soviet Ukraine, and the stories of those like Miroslav who insisted on the right to live in accordance with their values and convictions. Before we get jump in tonight, I want to thank those who helped to make this publication and indeed our program as a whole possible. And that is the Temerdy Foundation and the Temerdy Fund at King Badwin Foundation Canada. So thank you. And we're also hugely grateful to the University of Rochester Press and especially editor Sonia Kane for taking on this project. Before inviting our speakers to take over, I just want to introduce them and this memoir in a little bit more detail. Miroslav Maranovich, as you all know, is a Ukrainian and so social and political activist and commentator, currently vice rector for university mission at Uku Ukrainian Catholic University. He was the youngest founding member of the Ukrainian Helsinki group, and his commitment to the notion of human rights resulted in a decade-long stint in the Soviet penal system at the notorious Camp Perm 36 and in internal exile in Kazakhstan. For decades now, Miroslav has been a key important voice in the Ukrainian intellectual landscape, and his contributions to the dissident struggle in the Soviet Union and to the construction of post-Soviet Ukraine have been recognized around the world. His memoir, The Universe Behind Barbed Wire, in the Ukrainian original, is both a rich factual account of dissident life in 1970s Ukraine and of the Soviet repressive apparatus, and a compelling portrait of a life lived morally in the deepest sense of that word. The highly specific realities he documents in detail are matched by an exploration of the universal themes of freedom, both individual and collective, and of striving to live up to one's values and tenets of faith. It's our real honor to get to hear from Miroslav himself this evening. His discussant, his partner in discussion tonight is Timothy Snyder, who you also all know, a permanent fellow here at the Institute for Human Sciences, Levin Professor of History at Yale University, a renowned expert on Eastern European history, and most importantly for our purposes tonight, author of the foreword to the universe behind barbed wire. As for tonight, as you all overheard already, we will proceed like this. I will turn the floor over to Tim and Miroslav for them to discuss Miroslav's experiences, as well as some of the bigger themes that his memoir so insightfully elucidates. During their conversation, if you'd like, you're welcome to submit questions via the chat function. And then at the end, I will draw on these questions and pose a couple more synthesizing concluding questions to our discussants. Thank you both so much for being here this evening and the floor is yours. Okay, thank thank you very much, Kate. Um, and I, I, I want to I want to re just re repeat Kate's words about the cooperation that was involved in producing this. This is, of course, um, Miroslav's book, and we're delighted that we can play a small role in bringing this important work to what we hope will be a, a broad audience beyond Ukraine. As Kate says, this is this is uh, this is part of our mission. Our, our program here at the Institute for Human Sciences is called Ukraine in European Dialogue, and the word the word dialogue is very carefully chosen. The notion is that there 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 are subjects, and human rights is one, and historical memory is another, which are inherently enriching to to, to both sides or to all sides. And we were very glad that we got the opportunity practically to cooperate with Miroslav in the publication of this book. Um, I was glad to be able to write the brief forward. What, what Dr. Younger was unable to say in her own introduction was that she also very carefully worked through the text. So we're, we're grateful to everyone who took part and we're glad to have this chance to, to launch the book. I wanna say, before I begin asking um, questions to Miroslav, I'm gonna say just a few very brief words about the structure of, of the book. Um, it's, it's a memoir in three parts. The first part concerns essentially Miroslav Maranovich's family and his early life with the critical question being how, 
how is it that a young man from Galicia um, trying to make his way in Kiev, how is it that he becomes a human rights activist? What is it about the general history of Ukraine? What is it about uh, the history of his family? What is it about his friendships? And what is it about that moment in Ukrainian and, and, and Soviet life in the early 1970s, which made human rights seem like a field of activity? It seems to me that's, that's the question in the first book, in the first part of the book. As Kate says, Miroslav Marnovich makes, makes a choice um, and that and almost immediately after he makes the choice to join the Ukrainian Helsinki group and to take part in its, its, its modest but extraordinarily impressive activities, very soon after that, that choice leads him to, um, to the Gulag, to, to, to PAM 36. And the second and the longest section of the book concerns um, that concentration camp, concerns um, the the, 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 the seven years that Miroslav spent there, um, the structure of the camp, the, the ways the camp was meant to dehumanize, but also the encounters within the camp, the friendships within, within the camp. And from Miroslav's point of view, which I hope we'll, we'll have a chance to hear, to hear more about, um, the meaning of the experience for him. And then there's a final, a final shorter part of the book, which deals with Internal, ex internal exile in, in Kazakhstan. So now that I've given this brief introduction, my role here is going to be very modest. I'm going to, I'm going to ask Miroslav a series of questions, um, give him a chance to reflect and, and, um, and, and, and try to convey some of the essential ideas of this book. And insofar as we can get him to do it, some of the essential experiences of, of his life. Um, I knew Miroslav Maranovich a bit before I read this book, but now having read this book, I must say I know him much, much better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and so I'm hoping that some of those, some of the personal side of the of the memoir can come out as well. So I'd like to I'd like to start with a question which is personal, but which leads us into some of the larger themes of, of human rights and history. The, the question is, could you tell us? about the first time you got in trouble with the law. Can you tell us about your first encounter with the police? Well, uh, this is the story when I really, for the first time in my life, was taken to a police station and it was connected with my visit to uh, Shevchenko, to the Shevchenko monument in, in Kyiv. Uh, in 1972-73, uh, it was very popular to put flowers at this mon monument to commemorate the date when Taras Shevchenko was reburied, reburied on the Ukrainian soil. However, when the Khrushchev uh, saw of spring was over, this tradition was suddenly deemed objectionable. Even though there was no official prohibition against honoring Shevchenko, it was certainly not encouraged. Uh, with the doctrine of the merging of nations, the government expected uh, its loyal citizens to willingly and enthusiastically abandon any rudimentary vestiges of nationalism. This is, as you understand, this is a parody for uh, the Soviet language. Uh, placing flowers at the Shuchenko monument on May 22nd meant violating this unspoken taboo. And the key point was that the tradition to commemorate was established by the Ukrainian diaspora. So it was presumed by the KGB that our socialist country had been subjected to the diversionary tactics of some diaspora banderites. Uh, so Mikola Matusevich, my friend at that time, Natalia Yakovenko, now historian, very famous historian in Ukraine, and I put flowers in the morning before going to work. Uh, after some 
quiet moment, we dispersed it, and I headed for Juliana Airport for my return flight to ivano frankivsk where I lived by that time. But at Juliana Airport, I was apprehended by the police and taken for questioning uh, to the nearest police station. My things were searched and then finally the crucial question was posed. What was the purpose of your visit to the Shevchenko monument? <laughs> it was so, so funny even at that time. But it, uh, it, yeah. And uh, so it was clear that we uh, had been watched uh, and the Shevchenko was dangerous even in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the first time when I, I found myself on radars of police, not KGB, because KGB was uh, um, early before. So it's it's such an I found it to be such an interesting moment because it it starts to it starts to help us to think about what Soviet Ukraine was. Um, so of course you're you're arrested for laying flowers at the monument of the great Ukrainian poet. But at the same time, there is a monument of the great Ukrainian poet standing there. So there, there is this, there is this, there's this tension and this fluidity of what it what's acceptable, right? What's ex what kind of Ukrainianness is acceptable. And as you say, it's not written down, it's something which you which you feel it's something like a taboo. And so this leads me to ask you what that felt like, like if you can think back to the early 1970s in Soviet Ukraine, you're, you're a young man from, from Galicia and, and you're spending more time in Kiev. What was that like? What did you think then about the Soviet Union and Soviet Ukraine? Did you think that there could be a future of the Ukraine? Well, the first picture that comes to my mind is the following. In those years, I had my ear glued to the enemy voices of enemy voices in parentheses mm -hmm. uh, of Radio Liberty, Voice of America, the BBC, and Deutsche Welle. Uh, it was rather hard work because a listener had to distinguish the voice of, of the an announcer uh, amidst all the Soviet jamming. Mm. Uh, thanks to these programs, I listened to things that were forbidden in the uh, Soviet Union. So the critical attitude toward the mm. Soviet Union was from the very beginning. And in the sense, it was the Fra Prague Spring Mm -hmm. that had the most significant influence on my developing worldview. So uh, the next picture will be of a young me witnessing an astonishing event in Lviv in September 1968. Soviet tank <clears throat> divisions uh, returning from Czechoslovakia after mm -hmm. the Kremlin had crushed Prague's uh, defined love of freedom. Uh, back in August, when uh, five Soviet bloc armies had occupied Czechoslovakia, I had, had followed events as they unfolded, never taking my ear away from the radio receiver. My heart was completely on the side of the vanquished. And in my soul, I sadly and silently said farewell to Jan Palach, who mm. had publicly immolated himself in January 1969 in protest of the Soviet occupation. So along with thousands of other Lviv residents, I looked into the faces of the soldiers uh, on the, uh, looking from the tanks, uh, and it was extremely distressing. The soldiers 
were downcast and looked around nervously, while Lviv residents were silent mm. and morose. At least that's how I felt. Uh, that was complete silence. And uh, probably this third picture uh, is uh, that of me singing traditional kolada uh, or Christmas caroling in Kiev. Uh, given the conditions in Kiev in those days, it would have been virtually unthinkable to go caroling on Christmas Day. So groups of us went caroling on December 30, the 31st. Uh, however, it was difficult to go caroling because the KGB did everything in its power to prevent it. Once the KGB provoked Mikola Matosevich, my friend, and arrested him for 15 days to force us to, to give up. Nevertheless, we decided not to submit to this psychological pressure and go caroling anyway. Uh, we did, however, decide to bring our passports in case we were picked up. <laughs> and under no circumstances would we accept any invitations for a drink. <laughs> we walked around in a compact group. Uh, people reacted warmly on our caroling and this lifted our mood. Uh, still, we were keenly aware that we were being closely watched. Policemen would approach us to say, stop it, go home. Uh, but people greeted us very cordially. In the stores, we were showered with candy, and in pub public transport, we elicited smiles. Uh, so let me conclude that in all these examples, there was spiritual and ideological opposition to the Soviet realities. Mm -hmm. you know, this, this idea of uh, this notion of opposition that you're you're opposing something by singing or you're opposing something by 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 looking carefully in someone else's face is very interesting because here here we are in it, it, the events you're talking about are are seen from the point of view of of yourself in this moment in terms of the higher political history we're talking about the the beginning of the Brezhnev era the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968 is a signature moment of the Brezhnev era. The idea of normalization, that we should accept the world as it is and not question it, is, is a central idea of, of, the, of the Brezhnev era. And the things, that, the things that you're doing, though, are interesting and unpredictable and even joyful and somehow and, and somehow out of politics. They, they're both in and out of politics at the same time. And that's, that's what's interesting. I wonder if you could say in this connection a bit more about, about Kiev, about your Kiev. Because of course, in, the 19, in 1972, um, the leadership of the, of the Communist Party of Soviet Ukraine changes. There's a change in line. It's the beginning of a period of Russification um, in, in Soviet Ukraine. That's an important turning point and also part of, and also a signature policy of Brezhnev, the Russification of, of Ukraine. And that's just when you're coming to Ukraine, to Kiev, sorry, as, as a young man. And anyone who, who, you know, anyone who visited Kiev in the late Soviet period um, thinks of Kiev as a, as a Russian speaking city. Right, thinks of Kiev as a as a as as a provincial Russian-speaking city, and yet your Kiev in the book is joyful and colorful and interesting and full of friends. So I, I wonder if you could say a bit more about about your Kiev and and why Kiev was so important to who you became as a young man. Uh, <clears throat> let me start with the comparison with the attitude of my parents. Uh, they both lived in Poland before the war. Mm. Uh, so for them, Kiev was just a golden doomed 
dreamland beyond this Bruch River, <laughs> the, the borderline to, to the Soviet Union. For me, it had been already my land, my natural gravitational center. Mm -hmm. And it was this center that I had flown off like a moth drawn to the light. <laughs> and, and so my Kiev at that time was very interesting. Uh, I would, would, can even say that our Kiev, because uh, uh, once I moved to the capital, Mikola Matosevich and I became inseparable. People often even mixed our names. Uh, so uh, the life uh, had three major elements. First of all, trying to keep the spirits of persecuted patriots and the families of those who have been incarcerated up. Then the second point was participating in the Ukrainian cultural life of Kyiv and frequently organizing our own events. And the third point, living a life of useful fun. <laughs> <laughs> Often it would even have been difficult to differentiate between these three activities. We were young, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but perhaps the biggest sin attributed to na nationally conscious uh, Ukrainians in Kyiv were their efforts to preserve their Ukrainianness. Uh, today, it is difficult to even imagine how defined this was in the eyes of the general public. Mm -hmm. The appearance of two young men, not to mention a larger group of people, openly speaking Ukrainian without any inhibitions mm -hmm. was in itself perceived as an exception, as ex expression of rebellion. Mm -hmm. I can still remember the harsh looks of my fellow Kievites in public transport or just on the street as they tried to distance themselves immediately from us uh, because they were afraid of us. And however, uh, my attitude, my critical attitude to Kievites changed after the, uh, the 2004 Orange Revolution and especially after uh, the re uh, revolution of dignity in uh, the year 2013-14, when uh, Kievites warmly supported protesters. And it was very uh, important for all of us who came to Kiev for uh, participating in Maidan's. I, I, I like I like that you reminded us that you were you were young at the time because so so so, so much of the the logic of the book depends upon that it, it depends upon seeing a young man in a certain time and place making choices some of them seeming frivolous and some of them seeming serious and as you say it's it's hard sometimes to see where the fun stops and the serious part starts. And it, make, it made me think that one of the most serious things in life is, is the ability to do the things that you think are fun, that, that are, you have a very nice phrase in the book, which is that you were, you were punished for wanting to live a normal Ukrainian life, which got me thinking about what a normal life is and what a, what a Ukrainian life would be. And from here, I wanna ask you, about, about human rights. Because when we say human rights, we often think of something very abstract. Almost, it can almost seem distant and, and, and cold because it's so, it's so universal, right? But when I, when, I read, when I read your memoir, what I feel is a much warmer notion of human rights, where human rights have to do with the things that we simply want to do because of who we are. Um, that the, the unpredictable personality that we have wants to express itself, let's say in a Christmas carol or in a loud conversation. 
and that human rights in that sense are not abstract, but, but very concrete. But they're also historically concrete. I mean, you were, you, were coming, you were coming into this life in Kiev at the moment where the idea of human rights was also taking form. So I wanted, I wanted to ask you about that. In, in, in what ways did the idea of human rights, the language of human rights, come into your life? Uh, well, the, the notion of human rights really st stormed into my life. <laughs> and uh, there, were, there were three sources uh, for that. Uh, of course, uh, first of all, uh, Western media, uh, the radios uh, I mentioned uh, before, uh, and uh, uh, the most important, August the 1st, 1975, Helsinki Summit on Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, when on behalf of the Soviet Union, Leonid Brezhnev signed the final act. There was a special third basket um, and it required all signatories to respect human rights. Mm -hmm. uh, no doubt at that time, Brezhnev had no inkling that some people would take this document seriously and his signature seriously. Uh, but uh, the Ukrainian Helsinki group became a litmus paper that revealed everything to the world. Look, the Soviet Union signed this international agreement, but it continues to blatantly violate human rights. Uh, by divulging numerous Soviet violations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Helsinki Accords to the Western world, we could, we could prove that the Soviet system was anti-democratic and that Brezhnev's signature on any such document was just meaningless. Uh, then US President Jimmy Carter, he was the second uh, of the forces that inspired me uh, to take up the course uh, of human rights. Uh, he became an outstanding spokesman at that time. He was the first statesman who brought the struggle for the realm of civil society into the realm of international relations. Uh, obviously, he didn't manage to achieve all his goals, uh, but um, still Carter as a deeply devout Baptist can undeniably be credited with establishing a culture of human rights. Um, Jimmy Carter became my hero and uh, his call to protect human rights resonated with, within me. And may, many years later in uh, early 1997, I had the opportunity to, to thank him personally during a brief meeting in the office of the Carter Center in Atlanta in the United States. And the third voice, this was the Ukrainian one, uh, Oksana Meshko's voice. Mm. Uh, some, one day, one evening, Mikola and I ran into, uh, in, uh, into her, uh, while walking down a street in Kiev, and our conversation didn't last very long. Oksana just told us that the eminent dissident Mikola Rudenko was organizing a group that would fight for human rights. She suggested that young people like us were needed and invited us to join him. As we parted with her and continued on our way, we both felt the first murmurs of our new fate. Mm -hmm. I, I remember that moment very clearly. And on the one hand, we had no illusions. We both understood that we would inevitably end up getting arrested. On the other hand, we also understood 
that if we decline to join this group now, we would never be able to forgive ourselves. I was 27 at that time and losing your self-respect uh, at that age was something awful for me. Mm -hmm. So I finally joined the human rights movement and it was probably the most important day in my life uh, in general. So it was, I am very happy that I made this decision at that time. This was the blessed uh, decision. I, so, Miroslav, it's it's very nice to hear to hear someone speak positively of of Jimmy Carter. Um, I, I remember in the in the late nineteen seventies and early nineteen eighties in the United States, Jimmy Carter was was very unpopular, and his presidency was seen as failing. But I remember that at the same time, um, friends or acquaintances who were not Americans very often had a kind thing to say about Jimmy Carter and would say things just just as you've just said, actually, that it, people will remember what he had to say about human rights. So I'm glad I'm glad that that's turned out to be to be true. I think there may come a day when Americans will look back at the period 1976 to 1980 and think about it a bit differently as well. Um, I, I want to I want to follow through. Um, with this this wonderful and articulate way that you've spoken about the origins of human rights in, in 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 your mind in your group and this idea that you had to make a decision one way or another and that it was it was about it was about respect self-respect but it did bring you together with this group and i wonder if you could say something about what the, what what it was what it was like to be in the ukrainian helsinki group in 1976 and 1977. If you can think, so you were a young man and almost everyone was older. You were a young person, almost everyone else had more experience. What did that Ukrainian Helsinki group mean to you as, as, as a young person at the time? And then if you could compare that to how you think about it now. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, truly we were a relatively young men at that time and uh, in comparison with all other members of the Ukrainian Helsinki group, we looked uh, rather when and politically unsophisticated. <laughs> uh, my own position on human rights at that time was focused more on political disobedience to the Soviet system mm -hmm. than on any deeper engagement mm -hmm. uh, with the core issue of human rights. Mm -hmm. The deceitfulness of the Soviet system during my years as a dissident had reached such intolerably grotesque proportions that it was no longer possible to tolerate it and man maintain self-respect. Uh, I remember the gesture of uh, Russian uh, dissident uh, Yuri Orlov, who said, I have enough of that. <laughs> so it was more than people can uh, survive. Therefore, uh, at the beginning, I saw our work not so much as a struggle for some specific political ideas, but first and foremost, as an attempt to regain and retain our dignity um, and our right to survive as human beings, as human beings with our dignity. Uh, and uh, what is important in my mind at that time, uh, the pain of Ukrainian national humiliation was inseparable from the anguish of totalitarian oppression. Uh, so for me, these two sides are inseparable in the notion of uh, hum human uh, rights. Uh, by joining the dissidents and becoming a part of the movement of nonviolent resistance uh, to totalitarian terror, I had the honor of being one of the last witnesses to communist atrocities. Uh, witnesses against whom all the KGB's cruelties were powerless. Uh, and uh, here I should make a clarification. 
Had it not been for strong international reaction and support, we Brezhnev era dissidents would no doubt have been silenced in the Siberian wilderness, just like the millions of victims of the Stalin uh, era. Uh, so it is important not to overestimate the effectiveness of the dissident movement in challenging the Soviet system. And I would like to thank all our Western, Western partners for supporting us. But at the same time, I do not want also to undervalue uh, the sacrifices that my colleagues made placing everything they treasured on the line. Uh, so um, what was very impo important at that time and why our struggle uh, and um, attractiveness to human rights was so important. The Ukrainian liberation underground had existed prior to us. Uh, and uh, these people uh, have enormous courage to fight with the system. But for the average Soviet citizen, uh, underground organizations were not convincing. They must be enemies. Otherwise, why would they be hiding? Uh, thus, the um, unconcealed public existence and activities of the Ukrainian Helsinki group were fundamentally significant in this regard. We published our addresses, published our names, of course, in the material that were published in the, uh, in the free world, but our names and addresses were known uh, to KGB from the very beginning, and we didn't hide ourselves. I mean, that's, you, you, you've made a number of very important points here. I'm, one thing that your book brought home to me was this connection between uh, a, a personality and a nationality, right? I mean, we often speak of national rights as though they were one sort of entity and individual rights as though they were another sort of entity. But of course, if we, if we believe we're part of a nation, that's something which is inside of us. It's not something which is just outside. And another very interesting place, um, and, and this is where you, you, you left off, is this question of, of the public character of your of your actions um and uh, this th this is a, this strikes me as being important because it's it's about it's about setting an example i mean it's an un it's an unattainable example for most people but it's about setting an example you speak about um you speak about a, a, a sense that the system could no longer be endured you, you, you speak about disobedience rather than clear goals but part of what you and, and other Ukrainian Helsinki group members did was set a kind of example that, that this, this could be done. Um, but, yes. but, 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 but in doing it, of course, it came with a price. And in fact, the price is bound up with the action, right? In, in joining the Ukrainian Helsinki group, you had to understand that you would be arrested. And the, what, what you couldn't have known though, um, was what just what that would mean. So that's what I wanted to ask you about next. Um, you were arrested not long after joining the Ukrainian Helsinki group. What did you learn then? I mean, what did you learn about yourself or what did you learn about the system in your interrogation? Because in the, you, the, in the period between your arrest and your sentencing is almost a year, if I remember correctly. So this is a, this is a, if you're only 27 or 28 years old, that's a big part of your life already. So what what did you learn about yourself or about the Soviet system during interrogation? Yes, it's interesting question, but uh, <clears throat> let me postpone answering that uh, question uh, because I would like to react on what you said before, and uh, uh, there was an interesting uh, fact. We, of course, we were partners with. Russian dissidents. Mm -hmm. But there was a clear difference between Russian members 
of the Moscow Helsinki group and uh, members of all national uh, Helsinki groups, I mean Ukrainian, Lithuanian, Georgian and Armenian. Uh, we were considered by Russian uh, counterparts as uh, a bit polluted by national or nationalistic demands mm -hmm. because we combined um, the, our, um, our fight for against totalitarian state for human rights and we fought for um, cultural rights for uh, our national freedom. Uh, that's that's why there was a clear difference because uh, Russian uh, dissidents stood all exclusively for human rights in mm -hmm. the sense of civic rights. So now I, I uh, would like to come back to your interesting questions about uh, interrogation. Uh, mm, well, first of all, I learned from the uh, interrogator, he was uh, Alexander Bereza, uh, uh, that I have been given the status of an exceptionally dangerous state criminal. <laughs> uh, unless, of course, I were to repent. Uh, I found this very ironic and extremely funny. And once I even commented on, in, on it, it seems that murderers are not considered as dangerous to the Soviet uh, authorities as we dissidents are. <laughs> uh, to this, my interrogator shook his head and replied in all seriousness, yes, murderers are not as dangerous as you uh, because they don't infect others like you do. Um, during uh, my interrogations, I often uh, pointed out certain irrational aspects of the investigation. Uh, for example, uh, Alexander Bereza, my interrogator, would often repeat the following. We are putting you on trial not because of your beliefs. You are free to think what you want. Right. We are putting you on trial for what you are saying, that is for your concrete actions. And I joked in return, well, then the Soviet Union has clearly made a scientific discovery and managed to perform a unique lobotomy, separating thought from speech. <laughs> So uh, in general, it was, it was very interesting to be uh, interesting. I use this word because I was not afraid of my uh, course of, of my, um, I did uh, know very clearly that because I won't repent, I will receive the maximum term. So I didn't have anything to, to be afraid of. I, you were, so I think, you know, returning to, 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 to Brezhnev and the history of the Soviet Union, what you've, what you've said is actually, I think, very important to the political philosophy of the whole system, that it didn't need believers at that point. It, it, it just, it needed people who were separate from politics, who were separate from values, who were willing to keep quiet, who were willing to conform. And that, that seems to me to be a, a lesson for, for politics, which, which goes beyond the immediate time and place, and one which comes very clearly through your book. I want to ask you now, Miroslav, if I can, about, about what happens next um, in, the, in the second part of the book. So, you're, 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 in, you're interrogated for nearly a year. You're sentenced, as you said, to, to the maximum term. And you end up being incarcerated in Parm 36, which is, of course, not in Parm, but a facility out in the countryside near Parm. You're incarcerated there in this concentration camp for, for six years. When I read the second part of the book, 
it reminds me of something important about the human rights movement in the 70s and 80s, which is which we often forget, which is how much it's just concerned with facts. How much it's concerned with facts, with who who suffered, what was his name, what was her name, what was he sentenced for, what was she sentenced for, what did they actually do? These these basic facts, like the things which actually make up history. When a historian looks back at the, at the human rights movement in the 1970s and 1980s, this is what a historian sees. All of this concern for facts. And much of, much of the middle of your book is, is just this. It's, it's very often you, you're trying to make sure that we remember someone's name. We remember, we remember someone from the Caucasus. Or we remember someone from Estonia. We remember someone um, who otherwise might, might, might be forgotten. And that, that touched me, but it also it reminded me of the spirit of that era of, of human rights, where so much was about escaping the blurriness and the evasiveness in every, of everyday life and just getting the clearest, most basic facts down. What I wanted to ask you about, I'll just try to put this as simply as I can. We don't have a lot of time. You were in this facility for, for six years. What can you, what would you, if you're talking to people who have no idea about what a, a camp like this was like, where would you start to try to explain it to us? It's really very difficult to answer that question uh, in a rather short time. Um, but first of all, you're absolutely right when you say that we were very disciplined in this collecting information. And mm -hmm. I remember that um, that emotion, that feelings, when we uh, put down all this information uh, for smuggling to the free world, uh, and they, uh, this information later uh, formed the chronicle of current events, the famous uh, uh, Moscow uh, informational source. Uh, so, uh, I remember how careful we were to put only facts, exclusively facts, not uh, our attitudes toward, uh, toward these facts. And it was very important to be objective and to witness and to give testimony for, for uh, our persecutions. And, uh, of course, that... Uh, uh, the labor camp the zone is a place for struggle and punishment. <laughs> uh, these are in, were inseparable elements uh, that penetrated all aspects of camp life uh, for every prisoner. But uh, let me give you uh, uh, some examples from a specific area. I cannot list all of them, but specific uh, area, medical service. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, clearly selective medical services, as well as selective punishment were the norm. Uh, the administ administration was totally convinced that our ideological uh, disagreement with the Soviet status quo gave them a justifiable legal basis uh, for finding constantly new, new ways of punishing us. So it was uh, the uh, struggle, it was the competition. We wanted to fight for our rights and uh, uh, the administration wanted to persecute uh, uh, us. But uh, let me give you uh, a few examples, concrete examples. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a camp physician, Dr. Petrov. Uh, and uh, one of our prisoners, uh, Yosef Mendelevich, a Jew, uh, Man um, cited uh, some quote from Dr. Petrov in his memoirs. 
I quote, I'm a member of the Cheka, KGB, first and foremost, and only then a physician. <laughs> so you may imagine the moral statute of this, uh, the moral uh, stand of this person. Uh, he was uh, uh, a short uh, man who stood out for his distinguished, distinctive sense of humor. For example, when I developed gum uh, disease after a hunger strike, he told me during a consultation with a smirk, all you need is some vitamins strawberries, for example, and he smiled. Mm -hmm. Of course, he understood excellently well that it's impossible to eat strawberries in a labor camp. But he proposed, he, he, it was his advice for me to treat my disease. When I, I, I appreciate the way you're telling that story now because it, it helps readers to get future readers of your book to get closer to the tone of some of it. It's, it, it struck me as, as I read it, that this is, this is a book of humility, but not of boring humility. <laughs> it's, a, it's a book of, it's not a book of ostentatious humility. It's, it's, it's not, it's, it's a book of, it's a book of humorous humility, almost a book of self-aware humility. I, I noticed, I think I noticed in the book that your, your style of writing about the way you suffered in the camp, it seems like the first draft of that style was in your letters to your mother and your sister, where you had to find indirect ways to speak about what was happening and often joked. And much of that style remains in the, in the book itself, where, so the reader has to, has to actually read carefully to see just exactly what was happening. So for example, it becomes clear after a while that you spent much of your term in an isolation cell, but you never actually say so. It's only that there are so many things that happen while you're in an isolation cell, so many hunger, hunger strikes that you attempt that lead you into an isolation cell that the reader eventually realizes, okay, um, Maranovich spent a lot of his six years actually inside an isolation cell. But I want this leads me to the very last question that I have time to ask you about, um, and, and it's it's a, it's it's about a word that appears uh, towards the end of, of the second section, which I find very important, and that's the word that's the word freedom. So you 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 insist and and characteristically you quote your fellow prisoners about this. One of the things I like about the book is that you quote you quote the Russians and you quote the Jews and you quote the other people who are in the camp with you, often to give shape or expression to your own thoughts. But one of them is about freedom. There's this insistence that you and you and the people with whom you identified in the camp were, were free. I, 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 as my last question, I would like to ask you what, what you mean by that. Um, all uh, human rights defenders who became political prisoners were announced by uh, Amnesty International uh, to be uh, prisoners of conscience. Mm -hmm. And that is the key word to explain uh, my attitude toward freedom. Uh, freedom meant for me and still means for me to follow uh, the orders, if you like, or advices of my conscience. Uh, freedom uh, doesn't mean uh, um, uh, how it is in, in English, uh, said those all, all permissible, uh, all, all permissibility, or mm -hmm. uh, all permissiveness. Uh, Freedom for me is uh, you know, freedom is a ability uh, to follow, uh, to accept my values, uh, to be attached to these values and to uh, not to change my principles when there is some danger. Mm -hmm. Because many people today would like 
would love to live uh, in a moral world. But as soon as some danger comes, people put values aside and try to uh, give up. Uh, and uh, for me, freedom means not to give up when there is some danger uh, that forces you uh, to reject some values. And when I speak values, I mean uh, the basic values that uh, are in the DNA of human civilization. This is human dignity. This is go goodness. This is, uh, again, freedom. This is um, solidarity and, and so on, but, but in a positive sense, because we know also solidarity of corruption people, uh, corrupted people. <laughs> but, but this is freedom for me. Uh, to follow my conscience. I think that's a fantastic place to bring this, to begin to bring this wonderful discussion to a close. And in fact, that leads, that kind of speaks very directly to a more recent experience, right? The modern experience, today's experience in Ukraine, as you're talking about values, about dignity, it's impossible not to recall the language that is used on the Maidan and in the years since. And I wonder if as we come to a close here, Mirosav, you might be able to reflect a little bit about what it means to remember the experience of the human rights movement today, how it echoes in the Ukrainian experience today and what we can take away from it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, today I cannot imagine the same human rights movement as it was during the Soviet time, because now, um, you know, first of all, Ukraine is a, a democratic country with some problems, but still we have democracy and we have uh, incredible freedom in comparison with the Soviet time. Uh, so now human rights activity uh, uh, so to say, dispersed into some concrete, uh, concrete fields. Uh, for, exa for example, uh, uh, defending uh, 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 rights of, uh, uh, for example, sol soldiers' mothers, their attempt to defend uh, the rights of all um, men who fight today uh, uh, in our war with Russia. Uh, for example, uh, another example is uh, um, our uh, con consumer, consumer rights uh, and so on and so on. So there are different fields uh, that now we may work uh, to defend human rights. So now the situation changed dramatically, but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, it changed in the whole world because uh, it is awful what we see now uh, in uh, uh, Putin's Russia or Lukashenko's Belarus. Uh, it's, uh, as we say, this is the returning of uh, 1937. It's a code year, code um, uh, sign for most uh, cruel atrocities during the Stalin time. Uh, so now we have a challenge uh, that uh, the world has to rethink its attitude to uh, the communist past and its attitude to the ideologies or regimes uh, that were rooted in, in this communist uh, past in, and now uh, changed flags, changed slogans, but didn't change uh, their actions, their criminal actions. Well, your story, the memoir, as you write in your memoirs, this is a wonderful sort of impetus for us to rethink all of these things. So thank you for writing them. Thank you for joining us this evening. We will all 
again, send you all to check out the memoir, which is beautifully written. It's such a pleasure to have been able to work on this project with you. Thank you, Miroslav. Thank you, Tim, for your questions this evening. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you. Say, thank you for your attention and for your hospitality. <laughs> thank you. Good night, all. Good night. <laughs>